Good morning. My name is Melinda Herring. I'm the director, a director at the Superhuman Center in Lviv, Ukraine. We're building a world-class medical center uh, for Ukrainians who need prosthetic devices, PTSD, reconstruction, surgery, and rehabilitation. And I also am a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and I've been working on Ukraine since the third or fourth day of creation. Um, it's really an honor to have a chance to moderate this panel. Thank you very much, uh, MSI. So this panel is about a people-centered return to sovereignty and peace in Ukraine. We have four fantastic Ukrainians uh, on screen and then a great expert with us as well who spent the last year in Ukraine uh, during the war and has been all over uh, the country. So excited to hear uh, from Felicity too. So I'm not going to prolong this, but I just want to say that this is an extremely difficult situation thinking about peace in Ukraine. So I have a lot of factors on my piece of paper and I know that you do as well. We have a lot of issues even before we can get to the negotiating table to confront. One is that we have millions of IDPs uh, all over Europe and we have the issue of Crimea and its territorial status. Putin tried to steal it in 2014 and that's a major legal issue that's going to have to be overcome and a part of the discussion and my colleague Maria is the best expert in the world on Crimea so she'll have a lot to say on that. We also have extremely high rates of PTSD uh, the World Health Organization estimates that one in four Ukrainians, this includes children, will have some kind of serious psychological uh, need as a result of the war as it continues. We have a country that's awash in guns and violence. And uh, if you spend any time in Ukraine, uh, you see that there's rising anger. Uh, you can see this reflected in people's driving. You can see it reflected in relationships. You can see it reflected in divorce rates as well. Uh, we also have the basic problem that neither side wants to negotiate. So Volodymyr Zelensky has said no way after the war crimes that we saw last year. Uh, and he's reflecting people's opinions in Ukraine. And Putin shows no signs as well. It seems that only Europe wants the Ukrainians to negotiate. So these are some of the issues that I think will feed into the discussion. So let me introduce our fantastic uh, panels. We have Alexandra Matvichuk, who won the Nobel Peace Prize. She's the chair of the Center for Civil Liberties. If you haven't heard her before, I recommend recommend you read her op-ed in the Washington Post. Uh, she talks about justice in a really powerful way. She's fantastic. She's going to join us by video. Then I have Eka Thekishvili, and she's the chief of party for the USAID-funded program called Anti-Corruption Champion Institutions Project in Ukraine. She's held every big job in Georgia. She's been the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Prosecutor General, and she's very down-to-earth and awesome. So really happy to have Eka. Next, I have Dr. Hannah Hopko, also on the screen. She was the chairwoman of the Rada's uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. She's here in D.C. often. She's a big activist from Lviv. She's the chair of an organization called Ants right now. Uh, Hannah, really glad to have you. I have Maria yeah. Tomak, who's, like I said, the greatest expert on Crimea. I know she's the head of the Crimea Platform Department uh, um, at the Mission of the President of Ukraine in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. Maria, that is the worst title I've ever heard. It's so long. But she is a <laughs> long about that. activist on Crimea and has been making films and raising the public profile of Crimea for a long, long time. We have Mustafa Naim, who will be joining us shortly. He's the head of the state agency for the restoration and development of infrastructure of Ukraine. Mustafa's done everything. He's been a journalist. He's been a member of parliament. He's worked in the infrastructure department. But most of all, Mustafa is a doer, and I really am glad that he could join us. And finally, we have Felicity Gray, who's the global head of policy and advocacy at the uh, Nonviolence Peace Force. And like I said, she just spent a year in Ukraine and has been all over the place working with Ukrainian organizations and has a, a great perspective. So with that introduction, let's jump in. Uh, I have a number of questions just to get people started, and then we'd love to have your questions from the audience here in Washington or if you're watching online. So you can submit your questions, you can type them, uh, and I'll be glad to read them. Uh, when the mic comes to you, if you could ask a question and just say your name and, and where you work, that'd be fabulous. Okay, Hannah, it's your turn. So we've talked a little bit about how difficult this is going to be to build a peace process. How can Ukraine develop a process that uh, for recovery that relies on public input when the state has become so centralized during the war. What recommendations would you have to ensure public input? And should Ukrainians from Russian occupied regions get a say in the process? Hand of the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Melinda. Melinda, it's an honor for me today uh, to share my thoughts, my experience and contribute, uh, as I believe, uh, to victory of Ukraine, because uh, Ukraine uh, victory is a common victory. It's a victory of Europe, it's a victory of US, it's a victory of Taiwan, it's a victory of democracy. And um, in 2014, when Russia invaded Ukraine by illegal annexation of Crimea, it's already 10 years of ongoing aggression against Ukraine. And after the full scale escalation, so what Russia is doing now against us, Russia is committing uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, act of aggression, act of genocide and ecocide. So I think it's really important for us uh, when we are talking how uh, uh, to win Russian uh, war uh, of aggression against us. I think because you mentioned peace talks, I think uh, we cannot uh, achieve peace at the expense of justice or justice at the expense of peace. So this is why we in Ukraine expert community develop a, a sustainable peace manifesto, never again uh, 2.0. Uh, it's really important um, by, uh, so, uh, compelled uh, by the calls of our defenders, the armed forces of Ukraine. Um, we authors of this sustainable peace manifesto, the representatives of civil society have taken the liberty to detail the conditions for sustainable peace manifesto. And of course, there are two main parts. First, as responsibility for the war. We do believe that punishment for crimes of aggression, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide are key. And this is why I think we need to uh, uh, work on uh, establishment of tribunal and actually uh, to seek justice. Also, um, compensation for all material and moral damages caused to Ukraine by the Russian Federation. It's so important. And also, uh, second, it's ensuring sustainable peace, which means also Ukraine's membership in the EU and NATO. And uh, I do believe that during uh, the Vilnius summit, we will um, get uh, I do, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I wish to see that mistakes from Bucharest summit in 2008 learned and uh, invitation for Ukraine, for NATO, and after uh, we win the war, uh, ratification of all documents is happening. Because I think we have to learn uh, uh, the lessons after almost 10 years of ongoing Russian aggression. And also when we are talking about ensuring sustainable peace, so besides these prerequisites like Ukraine joining NATO in the EU, also it's really important to overcome stereotypes and Russian lobbying regarding Ukraine in Western politics. There is this fear, what if Russia is being defeated in Ukraine, what next? It's uh, similar to uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, disintegration in 1990s when there were uh, some Western leaders saying to Ukraine uh, when we were regaining the independence. And also, let's be very frank, we, we have to understand that we are not talking about the regime change in, 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 inside Russia. It's also about decolonization of Russia and overcoming Russian totalitarianism. So I think, uh, Melinda, uh, um, it's really important that we have the same vision for victory of Ukraine. 95% of the population believe that we are winning and we have to win. So uh, why it's important? Because Ukraine is an independent state where everyone now is contributing to uh, victory. Territorial defense, local communities, volunteers, um, think tanks, and, and other experts which are mobilizing civil society organizations which are working in the international arena. So I think we have to keep in mind the people after such suffering every day. Uh, this Now I'm in Stockholm participating in international conference, but this week I started 
by visiting Kherson city and delivering humanitarian aid from Taiwan to local communities. And uh, what happened during last days in Kherson, it's a nightmare when innocent civilians were killed and actually Russian missiles attacking train and actually wounded and killed uh, Ukrainians. So this is why we are keep asking for fighter jets, attackums, more weapons, because it's so important that Russia is being defeated in Ukraine this time. Because after eight years of peaceful settlements, after eight years of political diplomatic attempts or efforts to um, uh, solve Russian aggression, we ended up with Russian full-scale war, a genocidal war against us. So um, I think it's uh, really important that uh, now when we are talking about Ukraine's resilience, what is the part of our resilience? So it's really important that besides gen generating a victory strategy for us uh, globally, we also have to keep working inside Ukraine, reforming our state, especially after last summer, Ukraine received a candidate status and now we are preparing and we do believe that this year, Ukraine and Moldova, uh, uh, the EU will be opening negotiations for uh, as the next steps for our future membership in the EU. And Georgia, I do believe will also, will be um, granting the candidate status because it's about the Black Sea security region. And uh, coming back to your question, I think um, it's really important to keep supporting local communities. This is what we are doing. Uh, we are helping them now to uh, develop roadmaps, also to build bridges, uh, partner, uh, partnership programs with uh, different cities, communities in European Union, in the US, like this week, mayor of Kiev, uh, and mayors of other Ukrainian cities are in the U.S. Uh, uh, trying to bring more support to Ukrainian local communities. And also uh, talking about uh, Ukraine victory, I think it's crucially important to be on the same page and has to have this consolidated position, transatlantic position or like a, a political uh, Rammstein vision on victory of Ukraine. And I'm very thankful to US Congress that on April 26, the victory resolution or uh, resolu resolution on Ukrainian victory was registered in Ukraine, uh, in U Ukraine Congress, <laughs> in US Congress. Uh, so, uh, and in that resolution, bipartisan resolution, the, uh, the House of Representatives affirms that in the policy of the US, uh, they are seeing Ukraine restoring, uh, restored to its international uh, recognized 1991 borders. Also, uh, uh, Ukraine holds that the peace brought by Ukrainian victory must be secured by integrating Ukraine into NATO. Also ensure that Russia Federation pays reparations and global community helps uh, to rebuild Ukraine. And actually also the leaders of the Russian Federation are held accountable and there is a justice for victims um, of crimes Hannah, committed Hannah, by Russia. Let me, let me, Hannah, so let me stop you there. Important. Yeah, so this is the, really thank, important. Thank you for mentioning that, that yeah. new resolution. I think it's really important. I, I wanna ask you one really practical question uh, because I know this is something you really care about and people care about it here. Uh, can we talk a little bit about um, IDPs and the women and children who went abroad? So we know that millions have gone abroad to Poland, to all over uh, Western and Central Europe. Can you think about this as a, a former lawmaker? Are you worried that these women and children won't come home if the war drags on for several more years? And what kind of, of things could the government do now to offer maybe low credit loans, free housing help, some kind of job retraining to get people to come back? I hear you that on justice and, and security concerns on the big issues, but let's talk about the, the practical day-to-day -day issues as well. So there are some data, especially um, the Opora network did in Poland, what is the percentage of Ukrainians which would like to stay and what are uh, trying to uh, be back home, especially for a new um, uh, study season from September this year. 
So I think uh, first and the most important is security. So this is why we need more anti-air defense system. We need to win the war. But actually, I also agree with you that for Ukrainian farmers, Ukrainian entrepreneurs, which are in Ukraine, and actually economy or economical front is also very important because many businesses uh, were destroyed and actually we are suffering also a lot. So I think this uh, um, low credit loans is a great idea, especially to support women and small and medium-sized enterprises and also look at Ukrainian agriculture sector. So besides big projects like demining, which is key, we also need uh, uh, low credit loans for them to keep work, working and during this uh, planting season 2023 to plant seeds to feed the world. But it's all connected issues. I spoke with Ukrainian farmers and they, are, uh, uh, they still have uh, harvest collected from 2021 because of the blockade uh, um, of the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov and Russian sabotage. They cannot export this. So without demilitarization of the Black Sea, so this gr grain deal is only partial solution. So for farmers, they need to have this guarantee, financial mechanism of support, uh, um, um, some uh, support for demining and actually knowing that uh, Russia will not uh, keep destroying elevators. Uh, also, um, like it happened recently in the Parisia Oblast, when the biggest uh, uh, farmer, uh, all his um, industrial com complex was destroyed. It's a millions of millions. And the question is who will compensate this money for them? Also for women. Women are suffering a lot and they don't have luxury just uh, not to perform well uh, and just to cry or to be exhausted. We have keep fighting and seeking for different opportunities, financial, actually to help our kids with education because they, kids um, which are in Ukraine, they are missing of, uh, the opportunities to study in, in, in schools because of all this uh, constant uh, Syrian um, uh, and um, Russian attacks. So I do believe that, and I'm very thankful to USAID programs, which are helping local communities to adapt to new realities. And what we are doing, we are working with uh, smaller uh, local communities and uh, the leadership of these communities uh, in many cases are women. These communities were under occupation. And now the question for them, how institutional capacity, how to find new partners, how to bring digital instruments for recovery, not just building back better to rebuild uh, damaged or destroyed uh, residential buildings. It's also about um, um, environment issues uh, because uh, Russia is committing ecocide, destroying our nature. It's thank about you so much, Anna. Thank you. That was that was such a good comprehensive answer. And thank you for mentioning schools as well. Eka, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Good to see you. Um, I, I have a couple of questions for you, but take these in the direction uh, that you want to go in. Uh, you've, you've done this rodeo before. So I'd like to ask you uh, from your, where you sit, uh, focused on anti-corruption, what mechanisms should be put in place to ensure that the recovery funds are not misused or stolen? There's going to be a lot of money in Ukraine uh, as the reconstruction process really heats up. And can you say also a bit about how Ukrainians can integrate the importance of EU and NATO integration processes into the reconstruction process? Mm -hmm. And say a little bit more about the role of local leaders in rebuilding. Should the process be directed by Kiev, which uh, right now it looks like it will be, or should it be locally directed? And how is that division of labor working? Eka, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Melinda, and then I'm very glad to be here with all of you and share my thoughts. Extremely important topic at an extremely important and challenging times, not just for Ukraine, but that I would say for all of us globally. We are at a time of infliction when we are still wondering whether the rules-based order will be maintained globally, right? Uh, or, or we will see a shift that will be in a very negative direction for, for, for peace and stability um, and sustainability of our development anywhere. <clears throat> In this globe. Now, before answering your questions, just very few words, perhaps just to add what, what um, Hannah mentioned. 
uh, in this very context for this peace con uh, discussions that we are having at different sessions. Uh, we are uh, talking about building peace and sustainability of that in a very particular situation and context of a conflict that is an international conflict. And I think that is not frequently to the fullest understood when, when we speak about what it takes to build sustainable peace in the country that is aggressed by a neighbor like Russia, which is a nuclear power. And why uh, not only Hanna, but every Ukrainian that you will speak to will speak about victory first, because there is a clear realization that for any peace to be sustainable, there needs to be clarity that peace is won because unfortunately it is not given uh, in this very situation by consensus that Russia could be ready to deliver. In other words, um, all of the techniques, frameworks, um, visions that we might have had in any other situation of conflicts that are internal in other countries from experiences in different countries from around the globe, are only somewhat applicable to the situation in Ukraine because it is a very uh, unprecedented situation for 21st century, I would say so. Unfortunately, 20th century had uh, precedents of uh, similar situations, but not in our century and in our times. Having said that, we do have a clear realization that for the peace to be sustainable, uh, peace state building process in Ukraine will be extremely important because this will the, the time will come and I would not only hope that I'd expect that it will be uh, sooner rather than some might expect for the time to come when Ukraine will switch in the post victory stage of its own development where state building process reconstruction and rebuilding as part of that will be pivotal in terms of maintaining that belonging sense of common purpose for all constituent parts of the social fabric of Ukraine. And with that, making the peace sustainable within Ukraine when it comes to trust and credibility and belonging for the common purpose when it comes to all of Ukraine, all of the Ukrainian people, which are multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and that what makes Ukraine beautiful as a country, that diversity that it represents. And I really do uh, see uh, Crimea with its own uh, diversification into the components of Ukraine, part of that as well, obviously, in the future. Having said that, rebuilding and reconstruction will be uh, one of the main uh, pillars of that process because country needs to come back, economy needs to bounce back, trust in the possibility of recovery needs to come back. That needs to be one of the driving forces for the people that you've mentioned, women, uh, children uh, that are outside of Ukraine, millions of them, for them to come back sooner rather than later, for them to be part of recovery and rebuilding of Ukraine. And that can only happen when there is trust that the process is not only effective, efficient, uh, that it strikes balance between the clarity of the process and deliverables that I expected sooner rather than later in the country that has suffered for so much, uh, but that the trust that it's integral, so that the transparency and accountability is ensured. And this is not something that is important only for those that will be helping Ukraine in this effort as the donors in this process, uh, partners and strategic allies, but then for Ukrainian people itself. And I think because of that, what we see clearly in our work now in Ukraine, something that is too su surprising to so many when I talk about that outside of Ukraine, that Ukrainian civil society and Ukrainian public institutions, representatives of the political class of Ukraine, government of Ukraine, have a very clear realization of that. So in the midst of the war, when we have to go quite frequently to the shelters to ensure security of our team members, of ourselves, we work very hard shoulder to shoulder right now with our Ukrainian partners in ensuring that those mechanisms that will have to ensure the transparency and accountability of the process are actually thought through, prepared and put in place even before an actual large scale reconstruction process starts. And we already see that the piloting of that at a smaller scale is already taking place at the level of fast recovery. That is happening by the way in Ukraine every day. We talk about big reconstruction and rebuilding, but every day when built the bridges, the roads and then damaged houses need to be recovered during this bombing and air raids that uh, Ukraine experiences all over the country uh, so frequently, unfortunately, 
unfortunately, Ukrainian authorities are doing their best to make it so quick that sometimes in few days you have rebuilt the bridges and you have the roads that are already usable after having big holes, after uh, shelves are hitting uh, infrastructure. Having said that, um, it's not that everything is clear for now. It is an experiment of a kind, an intellectual and practical exercise that in so many so many ways is unprecedented. So what we do right now, we try to learn from all the experiences in the past, from different crisis situations, even in natural disasters that we could have accumulated as a, as a practical experience that could be informative in this process. But in so many ways, frameworks that are being built now in Ukraine will be very much unique tailored to the Ukrainian context and will be much larger in terms of the scale. And I would really hope and expect better in terms of having that digitalization being ingrained into this process so that accessibility to data, transparency of data, and with that accountability becomes a default modus operandi rather than something that needs to be specifically at, uh, assured because of you know paperwork that needs to be preceded in reporting and accountability of the kind that would have been more aligned to the practices again of, of the past. So what what uh, to, to your question as of central or local, I think it will be a mix and this is so far how it is thought through. One cannot underestimate in this process the role of the central authorities because when there is a crisis of a kind that country faces, there is a degree of consolidation that is needed inevitably so, so that everything is put, that it's managed, and then there is no understanding that there is too much diversity and a disparity in terms of who is dealing with the situation in different localities in different ways. And then from the security point of view, obviously centralization is no surprise when it comes to the military action and then beyond that as well with the civil security related issues. But then we already see that at the level of the central authorities and then at the level of partnership with several of the central authorities of the civil society organizations, right, Rice Coalition, for example, there is a great understanding of the fact that local communities will be an inevitable constituent part of decision-making processes, including by initiating the project for reconstruction and rebuilding, by being part of implementation, and at the own level as well, ensuring uh, monitoring, oversight, and accountability of that. What we are thinking through as well at this level is how much even at the level of initiation of projects before projects are being formed for uh, reconstruction purposes, local communities are consulted. So the digital platforms that are being built now for overall digital management of the process are already reflective of those, not only concerns, but one would think opportunities really for making the process right in this case. The big onus of responsibility uh, lies with all of us from international community as well, not only to make sure that these frameworks are well thought through and helped to be built and so that the capacity is made available for that, but at the level of the donors as well, when on a bigger scale, the platform for pledging the resources that will be needed for Ukraine's reconstruction and rebuilding will be uh, accumulated. There are proper mechanisms, obviously, collectively that are, uh, that are ensuring accountability and transparency at all levels for the funds that need to be then used for the reconstruction and rebuilding of Ukraine. In other words, there is this cluster of what needs to be done at the level of Ukrainian authorities with engagement of civil society and local communities, but then the donor community as well needs to make extra steps in terms of ensuring that at all levels from their side as well, that level of accountability is being assured. There are great efforts that are already being done in this direction. Uh, very uh, proactive work that is uh, taking place. I'm sure that uh, those who will be able to participate in the main event and the London uh, rec Recovery Conference this June or side events that will be organized around this uh, big event will already be able to have a first glimpse uh, already in terms of the uh, digital platforms that will be used for the management of uh, of the reconstruction process, but then have an ability already to see how the pilots and better versions of that will look like. Uh, having uh, just just to move a little bit maybe uh, beyond that as well, uh, and uh, with relation to the question on EU and NATO, uh, EU and NATO both are anchoring uh, anchors, so to say, of the development and state building process for Ukraine. This is not just an aspiration for Ukraine. This is where Ukraine sees itself not only belonging to, 
but then in practical terms, working together as the final destination of finalization of a, of, of that modern uh, European state building process for Ukraine, peaceful and sustainable economically and prosperous. Uh, EU and NATO are already significantly engaged in um, anchoring that process of reforms from different angles. And NATO is more from the security front, EU from the development of Ukraine from all directions when it comes to the economy, political, democracy, rule of law, anti-corruption. We already see that conditions that we are attached to the status, uh, candidacy status, and then the opening of the negotiations are reflective of that. And I have to say that Ukraine takes all of those extremely seriously. So as much as pledge, of membership in both organizations remains trustful, credible, and then there is progress. I have no doubt that this will become both of these directions, historical anchoring uh, framework uh, for Ukraine's development and for irreversibility of that. Uh, and, and, and trust in that regard uh, obviously has to, be, has to be maintained from both sides, uh, from, uh, from the progress that Ukrainian side will maintain in this direction, and then for uh, corresponding steps that international organizations like EU and NATO will undertake to make sure that trust in the membership remains solid because of the way how that is reflected with actual process in accession process with both organizations. Thank you. And, um, that I would I would end on that not to take maybe too much time um, for from other speakers as well. I know that we're cognizant of Thank that. Thank you. Hang hang with us because I know that people will uh, definitely want to ask you about digitization. Thank you. It's always refreshing to hear from you. I, I really appreciate how practical you are. Uh, now we are going to bring our only in person <laughs> speaker into the conversation. So Felicity, how can peace building? principles form part of the ongoing emergency response what needs to be considered now to prepare the ground for a post-war scenario so please build off of some of the things that, that echo was saying as well thank you so much melinda and um thank you so much to my fellow panelists it's a privilege to to speak alongside you um, I think one of the things we know as a peace building community is that peace building is not just something that happens post conflict um, I think for too long we think about um, temporalities of peace in quite linear terms when actually um, peace building principles have to be part of the emergency humanitarian response that's ongoing in Ukraine uh, currently in response to the, the deep um, effects that this war is having on the civilian population. Um, I think that one of the key things that we as an organization um, have really focused on is the fact that it is so evident um, when you're on the ground in Ukraine how much of the work and the effort to meet humanitarian need is um, being led um, and activated by Ukrainian communities and Ukrainian organizations themselves and how um, how uneven that is with where resources are ending up. So you have all of the work happening at the local level from um, communities and Ukrainian um, NGOs, volunteer organizations, and then the vast majority of the resourcing for that humanitarian response sitting with international organizations and, and UN agencies. Um, and there is a real need to ensure that we are taking the leadership of Ukrainian organizations and communities. They know their needs best. Often they're the only ones on the, on the ground doing the response anyway and taking on that risk burden. Um, and, and ensuring that
Try that again. Say Hannah can hear me now. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, to recap, I was talking about how Ukrainian organizations and communities do the vast majority of the work, but have um, little to no access to the vast majority of, of humanitarian resourcing and why that's a problem. Um, for peace building. Um, the other thing I would say is that, oh, now we're getting the echo. Sorry, everyone. Um, the other thing I would say is that the burden of that response is having an enormous impact on Ukrainian civilians um, who are mobilizing and who are part of that response. It's having an enormous mental health burden. Um, the burden of this war, not only on those who are front frontline responders, but on civilians, kids, teenagers, they've had their educations disrupted. This places enormous pressure on communities. There's an enormous amount of internal displacement in Ukraine. So people that have moved from particularly communities in the East to safer areas in the West, you know, that's a huge adjustment for them, both for um, displaced communities and for host communities. And there's a lot of space to integrate peace building principles in the way that we support um, Ukrainian communities right now. Um, and the sustainability of this response, not just now in the emergency phase, but into um, a peace building reconstruction component has to, has to center on sustainability. And that means looking after the people that are doing this work, um, both in terms of psychosocial support and, um, and uh, social support in a broader sense for Ukrainian communities, but also in terms of making sure they have the resources they need to do their work safely as possible. Um, so Nonviolent Peace Force, we're an international organization, but we have um, focused intently in Ukraine on working alongside and with Ukrainian um, communities and organizations to support their ongoing work. They already had um, infrastructures in place. They have been leading on this even prior to February in many areas of the country um, and, and making sure that they, um, they have what they need has, has been fundamental for us and connecting them with, with donors, um, highlighting this through our advocacy and being on the ground with them doing the work. This should, the risk burden of all of this work should not be on Ukrainian communities alone. Um, and that's, that's really where we've, we've placed our focus and um, where we would like to see this response move um, even further. Thanks. I'll defer to the other um, panelists. Sorry, Thanks, kind of you. <laughs> You're the only person who, who's ever done that. Uh, th thank you so much for stressing. Uh, Hannah, can you give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me? They keep adjusting our, our, our settings. Eka, can you hear us? Can you give us a thumbs up? Okay, great. Thank you for stressing Ukraine first. I think the statistic I came across was uh, Ukrainian organizations get something like 1% of all the uh, humanitarian assistance that's coming. And the I call them the dinosaurs. The uh, donors have a tendency to work with the dinosaurs because they know them, they trust them. But uh, the argument that I'd like to advance, and I think that you'd probably agree with it, Felicity, is that Ukrainian organizations are very capable. They've been at this since 2014. They know how to absorb large amounts of money. They know how to do it in a transparent way, and they know how to report back to donors. So don't work with the dinosaurs. Look for the young, nimble, I don't know, what's what the prehistoric or the... Before you become a dinosaur, what are you? I don't know. But look for these younger, nimble Ukrainian organizations that are capable of doing the work and that know the local needs. So I, I think that's an argument that I would advance and hope that more people uh, would advance as well. Uh, Maria, thank you for being so patient. I am eager to hear from you on Crimea. So uh, I know that this is a bit of a grad school scenario, but uh, let, let's, let's work with me. So let's assume that Ukraine retakes Crimea. What happens to Crimea after a peace settlement? What rights are Russian citizens living in Crimea entitled to? What kinds of legal processes would Ukraine need to put in place so that people can reclaim their land and businesses and who should oversee the process? Maria, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you for providing me the floor and thank you for highlighting Crimea specifically. 
Um, I would like to start by referring uh, to the um, like phrase that you uh, said in the beginning about the territorial uh, issue on the territorial. Hey, hey Maria, we're having Crimea. tech problems again. Just hang tight one second. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, Maria. Okay, so should I start from, from the beginning, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. We can hear you now. Sorry. Okay, okay. okay. That, that's fine. Um, thank you for organizing this important discussion and having me here and for having the Crimea on the agenda. So I would like to start by referring uh, to the phrase that uh, you, Melinda, as distinguished moderator said in the beginning on the issue on the territorial status of Crimea. I would like to stress that from Ukrainian standpoint, and I believe from the international standpoint, there is no issue on the territorial status of Crimea. So Crimea is Ukraine. Uh, currently, Crimea is under the Russian occupation, as well as part of the Donbass of Donetsk and Luhansk region, uh, as well as uh, 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 part of Kherson region, etc. So it's a part of the Russian occupied territories, and the restoration of the territorial integrity of Ukraine means the uh, gaining back control over Crimea as well. So I think it's just important to understand and it's something that is acknowledged by the US, for instance, on the every possible international platform, including in UNGA, including uh, the Crimea platform as an initiative and various summits that were conducted with the participation of the high officials from, from, from Washington DC, and I would really like to, 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 to stress uh, this thing. But uh, going back to some practical issues, and I appreciate your very concrete questions. I would like to say that uh, it's not for, for now, for us as this institution with a long title, Mission of the President of Ukraine and Crimea, it's not something very theoretical. It's something that we work upon on the daily basis. So we're working on the range of the strategies related to the reintegration of Crimea after it's deoccupied. And we, we are doing this in the framework of our Monday, but also because it's one of the priorities of the president of Ukraine himself. So what we're talking about, we're talking about, for instance, about the strategy on the uh, uh, economical restoration of Crimea. And this strategy that we developed jointly with Minister of, Infra of Infrastructure and with the Kyiv School of Economy, so it focuses on the issues related to economy, of course, and the infrastructural issues in the first place. So how Crimea is going to look like or should look like after it's reintegrated. So what's the vision of, of Crimea? And we, we all understand, and Ukrainians understand it, and Ukrainian citizens in Crimea stress it all the time in our communication that Crimea don't have to look like it looked uh, prior to the occupation, let's say in 2013. It should be something completely different and much more, more modern and integrated, European integrated and integrated in the, in the modern civilized world. So, but another strategy that we're working upon and which is close, closer to those issues that you, you've, you've asked me is related to the first steps of the state after, the, uh, after Crimea is uh, uh, deoccupied. And we, if, uh, we have engaged lots of experts, uh, like more than 3,000 experts, and we have worked within working groups uh, to develop some vision, at least blanket for, for the beginning, like the strategy on various issues. And that issues include the resumption of the functioning of public authorities and human resources. We have at least 50,000 um, people kind of stuff that we need in Crimea for the restoration. So for, for, for when, when Crimea is the occupied. So it's a huge number of people. And now we're working with the academic institutions like Kyiv uh, National University of Tarasa Shevchenko in order to develop uh, the programs. They will be presented by the uh, permanent representative of the president in the next week. Just so it's just not something theoretical. Again, it's something very practical. And we have, uh, we will start those programs in the in the in the uh, in this year. So in the current year in autumn. So for those people who would like to work in Crimea after it's deoccupied, of course, these people have to need to have some uh, particular uh, knowledge and particular understanding and particular skills in order to work in Crimea. So and we're going to uh, prepare those people jointly with academic institutions. So another thing is the persecution amnesty administration, which is a huge issue. And I would like to remind here that Crimea 
is, as I said, it's occupied just as other Ukrainian regions under the occupation, but still it's a special case because of the duration of the occupation, it's 10 years, because Crimea was immediately, there was attempt to annex Crimea, unlike the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, so Russia didn't want to, to try to annex those territories, but Crimea was annexed from the beginning and was built into the kind of Russian, this Russian system of, of in all the in all the possible means. I mean, in, in terms of law enforcement, judiciary, et cetera, et cetera. So, and um, that's why also with amnesty illustration and other things related to prosecution, we will have, uh, I mean, it's a separate issue and we develop this, this, this vision for, for it. So we will have the issue of purification of documents and court decisions. More than 100, uh, one, more than, sorry, 1 million and, and 200,000 court decisions were issued so far by the occupying court. So are we going to review all of them or we, sh we should develop some, some other, other approach? So then we have property rights. You've asked me about that and it's one of the questions. So there is a bunch of questions within this property rights uh, thing that we need to answer. Humanitarian policies and demilitarization. It's a huge issue. Again, one of the most complicated because in Crimea, again, we have these layers and layers of Russian propaganda and Russian imperial narratives, starting from Russian Empire and the first annexation of Crimea, which happened in 18th century by, by Catherine the Great. Then we have like Soviet period and we have li layers of Soviet propaganda, which is related to Crimea. Now we have new occupation and uh, monuments of little green men all over Crimea and other marks, Russian imperial marks are all over Crimea, not to mention the militarization, including the militarization of children. And of course, the issue of which is the most, I would say, media, like spread it around the media, is the issue of citizenship. So what, what should we do with Russian citizen, citizens who came to Crimea illegally after 2014. So, and I can say here that um, now the answer is from the state as of now is that of course, those Russian citizens who came to uh, Crimea illegally after 2014 will have to flee Crimea because they are in Crimea, they're illegally now for now. But of course, in the cases when they don't want to, 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 get, to get out, of course, Ukraine will, uh, Ukrainian approach would be case, case to case basis. So the, 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 the individual approach, so to say, of course, Ukraine is not going to violate like uh, some basic uh, international law principles. So those cases will be reviewed on the case by case uh, basis. So, um, so, and also one thing that I would really like to mention, uh, sorry for taking maybe lots of time, is one of the principles that is going to be uh, in the center of Ukrainian approach towards Crimea, and that is something that uh, Ms. Eka uh, has mentioned, I believe, is the rights of indigenous peoples uh, of Ukraine and of Crimea. So currently Ukraine has the law on indigenous peoples of Ukraine and Crimean Tatars, Karaims, and Krimchaks. Uh, all of these people, they are, they live in Crimea. So Crimea is the place of uh, uh, of these people, so to say. Um, and therefore, um, uh, the approach would be to ensure the rights of these people and Crimean Tatars in particular as the biggest indigenous peoples of Ukraine and of Crimea precisely. And now we are developing the, we have already developed basically jointly with members of the parliament, with Majlis of Crimean Tatar people and, and with experts, the draft law on the status of, of the Crimean Tatar people, uh, which is specifically aimed at ensuring the rights of Crimean Tatar peoples after Crimea is deoccupied, but it should be adopted before just to make sure that, because I mean, we don't have to wait for the deoccupation of Crimea in order to um, adopt this legislation and to make sure that we underline the role of Crimean Tatars and the need to restore their rights. Because currently I think that I don't have to say it and probably you're all aware of it that Russia oppresses Crimea. It's, it's one of the most targeted groups are Crimean Tatars as well as Ukrainians now in Crimea. So the majority of political prisoners are Crimean Tatars. Crimean Tatars are targeted specifically by the mobilization campaign in Russia. So uh, therefore, which is of course is extended to Crimea as an occupied territory. So therefore it's one of the priorities and we're, if we're 
uh, talking about the human-centered approach, I think it's really important to mention how important for us is to preserve also this diversity in Crimea, not to preserve, but to bring it back. Because for Russia, Crimea is a military base. I think it's very obvious now. For Ukraine, Crimea is one of the definition that could be is a door or a window to global south also, uh, to all of those connections, uh, trade connections, cultural connections, uh, etc. that that you can uh, mention. So and it's really for us important to so that diversity is back to, to Crimea once it's occupied. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I think you have a book behind you that says it well. It says This Blessed Land, and it's a great book about Crimea. It's, it's very, very important for Ukraine to regain that territory. And thank you for highlighting the case of the Crimean Tatars who have been uh, displaced twice from Crimea to mainland Ukraine, and then many of them had had to move on again. So they've had a terrible time. Mustafa Naim, I hope that you can hear me and you can turn on your camera. I would love to see your face. Mustafa Naim. How are you, my friend? Can you hear me? Okay, this is when I get to play baseball announcer again. So Mustafa uh, is a, a fantastic voice. He's been a, a journalist. He's been in the Ministry of Infrastructure. He's now heading up a state agency for the restoration and development of infrastructure. <clears throat> and Mustafa doesn't seem to be hearing me. Uh, can we roll? Mustafa, there you are. Hi. Hello. I'm, I'm here. Yes, Hi, well. Mustafa. So we would love to hear more about your new agency. What role will it play in the process of reconstruction and who defines the needs of the region? The floor is yours, Mustafa. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you for, for, for having me and for your attention to this topic. Uh, actually, our agency was created three, four months ago. Um, uh, for this moment, we settled up our team here in Kiev and uh, on the ground. We are now gathering all inquiries from different regions about their needs. <clears throat> uh, what is the agency and what is the role of the agency? Uh, first of all, we are not the only one agency who will do all reconstruction and uh, rebuilding uh, projects because all stakeholders who have some damaged facilities, they can do it themselves. If they have capacity, if they have money, if they have funding and people who can arrange all these procurement issues and uh, all tender issues and then supervision of the construction, they can do it themselves. What is the agency, the role of the agency is to <clears throat> implement those strategic priorities of the government uh, for different stage of recovery. Uh, uh, doing all those projects, which is defined by uh, our Ministry of Restoration, Cabinet of Minister. And of course, all these uh, projects and all these facilities somehow are linked to the owners of these facilities. We are not owning those uh, buildings or facilities which we are now recovery. We're just doing, uh, providing the service to those uh, agencies it's on central level and local level who doesn't have capacity to do it themselves. Uh, who is the owner and who can be owner of this facility? Actually, uh, we have four types of, three types of these owners. First of all, it's private. Uh, and uh, private uh, property, we are talking about private houses and actually apartments. Uh, it can be also business, but we doesn't have now examples and uh, we didn't approach, we have not approached this uh, area. Uh, also, uh, it is about uh, government property. So those facilities which belonged by um, central government agencies, but of course, mostly in the biggest share of this facility, it is the local authorities and municipalities who are owners of these um, projects. And who actually <clears throat> defines the needs for the regions, it's done by them, first of all. And it is very important that no one can define their needs. We are not going to interfere this issue. And it's very important to understand that <clears throat> eventually <clears throat> the, uh, all these facilities will be used by people on the ground. So uh, of course, uh, all these needs and all these activities and reconstruction uh, works should be in line with the government strategies in different areas. I'm talking about healthcare, I'm talking about education, <clears throat> utilities, heating, energy standards, and etc. So if some regions need to rebuild something, uh, even before war, even now, they of course should uh, approve this 
buildings it will approve these uh, constructions with the central government agency regarding <clears throat> those standards for example if you're talking about uh, education there are different types of schools which are defined by the minister of education there are different uh, areas which can covered by these or that uh, facilities kindergartens or schools uh, or if you're talking about let's say healthcare institutions which is very important and uh, you know that we made big reform before war and uh, of course uh, not not all uh, uh, local authorities are uh, actually prepared to this reform but for this moment we understand that if regions want to restore something of course they should think and uh, in line those activities with the strategic directions which were uh, adopted by government parliament and all our international partners so <clears throat> again all needs will be defined by local authorities the prioritization of these projects can be done also by them but then all this list of the projects will go to the minister of restoration which in, in which we created um, inter uh, institutional uh, commission which consists of the representative of different ministries this commission uh, approving um, the uh, the list of the projects which are urgently should be recovered now uh, all this list will be uh, reviewed and screened by government then budget committee of the parliament will approve that they have funding for that and only after that this list of the projects as order comes to our uh, agency and we are implementing them on the ground so it's quite from my, my point of view it's quite balanced system now for this moment and again I will repeat that if some regions or some institution want to do something themselves they can do it we are not interfering on that if I know that and we are actually even more I would say that we <clears throat> are motivate uh, all local authorities uh, to do it themselves what they can do uh, if they can attract money from IFIs or from member states, and we have many other partner states who are helping our regions directly, providing them with fundings, and if these regions are able to do these uh, jobs and do this work, uh, we are very supportive to that and helping them on the ground with our offices to do it themselves, because the scale of uh, damages, it, it's so huge that one agency is not able to do uh, everything by itself. I think in future, <clears throat> I think in some year, uh, it will be more naturally um, structured because for this moment, for example, we are most, mostly focused not on all country, but on the, only on those 11 territories along the front line, which is mostly affected. And we are gathering inquiries from these agencies, from these regions, first of all. And we understand that there are different type of regions. Some of regions are capable to deliver this result, are capable to do all this procurement. They have good connection with the international community and they have good experience and expertise. Some of regions doesn't have nothing, even administration. And we understand that, but we are helping both. If uh, they're asking us, uh, we can do it. Uh, but if they can do themselves, we would prefer to help them to do it on their own uh, will and their own uh, with their own um, uh, efforts and and, and uh, resources. So uh, and uh, for future, I think in some year, uh, our agency will be the agency which will implement only big infrastructural projects, which will be inter-regional. For example, electricity uh, and the substations of uh, electricity. It's huge projects and huge facilities which cannot be afforded by uh, local authorities never it's 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 very costly and it's very expensive and it, it takes uh, a lot of time and needs many uh, experts from different uh, with the different expertise so all these projects can be done by our agency why actually for this moment government decided to do that with us and why we was defined as a main agency and it's very simple uh, um, explanation um, I would say that uh, we are the most experienced agency in country with the construction issues when we have experience to work with the international money and with the international procedures and uh, with the IFIs, which is not easy. Uh, and frankly speaking, it's very difficult. 
in some uh, sense. So it is not uh, simple procurement which we can do on Prozor, for example. Yes, it's much more complicated. Yeah, first and the second, we have big team on the ground. We have 24 offices in each region. It's 1,600 1, people on the ground who are now doing all these issues, helping regions screening this project. So it's for me and for all our team, is big proud to be part of this history. Uh, but again, the, there is no other agencies which can have uh, which have this kind of experience. And what is most important, I don't think that it is good idea to to uh, um, for example to ask to from for or to demand from some for example Ministry of Education uh, to construct something because it's not their job. It's some it should be done by someone who can do it. Or for example, local authorities who, of course, they built many things before. But when you're talking about thousands of the facilities in one day or one year or even two, three years, it's it's impossible. We have this experience before war, we did more than one thousand and a half projects per year. It's different bridges, roads and other facilities. So we understand how to do that. And we have this experience. And I hope that in future we will be I not I hope I know that we will be one of the most experienced to help government in their strategic priorities. I'll Thank you so much, Mustafa. Thank you. It's great to see you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your energy. And thank you for your smile. And I'm really glad to hear about the uh, tailored approach you're taking for every region and assessing who's capable and who's not. So we have about 10 more minutes. Uh, we have not seen the video yet from our Nobel laureate. So I'm going to ask to queue up the video. This is Alexandra Matvachuk, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for Ukraine. She's the chair of the Center for Civil Liberties. She couldn't join us, but she made a special video for you. So uh, without further ado, Alexandra. She's coming. So well, uh, we cue the video. Be thinking of your your questions. I know there's some questions here in DC and then online. And I promise she's really worth listening to. She's worth waiting. I know it's almost the lunch hour here. I know. Did we really have three years of COVID? Well, while we're waiting for the video, could I take some questions? Do I have any questions here in Washington? I have Mustafa, Naeem, Eka, Maria, and Felicity waiting for questions. Yes. Uh, if I can get you to come down, sir, and ask a question in the microphone, please. I, the microphone has a cord, so you're going to have to get up. I'm sorry. Okay, I'd love to take your question. Um, thank you everyone. Thank you speakers for presenting this really helpful information. Um, my name is Eli, I teach at Georgetown University. And I just had a, a question about um, some curiosities about the way we think about justice. So I've, you know, this is a, contested term and a difficult kind of theme to to lean into in this context and I've heard President Zelensky talking about a just peace and and other leaders um, sometimes when I hear the conversation about justice is that it it seems to kind of represent uh, a more retributive understanding of justice and when we look at some of the the research around, the distinctions between a retributive justice versus like a restorative justice, um, it actually 
indicates that retributive approaches are more likely to generate kind of cycles of violence in different, different ways, personally, socially, culturally. So if we're interested in like a sustainable peace, a durable peace, um, I'm curious uh, what the reflections are about how restorative justice can kind of feed into some of these processes, um, particularly recognizing that restorative justice includes the need for accountability, right? Accountability as understanding harm, acknowledging harm, and identifying ways to heal that harm. So that's a particular priority for restorative justice. Okay. I'm going to let Eka answer that question, then we'll take the video. Eka, go ahead. And yeah, I'll, try to, I'll try to be uh, very brief. I guess it's an echo. Oh, Eka, hold tight, please, just one second. Sorry. My name is Alexandra Matvichuk, and this is a huge honor for me to address to this distinguished audience. Yeah, please, please go ahead with oh, the video. That's great. E Eka will remember the question. She's quite Very smart. <laughs> human rights lawyer. And I have been applying the law to defend people and human dignity for many years. At present, I and other Ukrainian human rights colleagues are doing our job in the circumstances when the law doesn't work. Russian troops deliberately shelling residential buildings, schools, churches, hospitals, attack evacuation corridors, manage filtration camps system, organize forcible deportations, commit murders, tortures, rapes, abductions, and other kind of offenses against civilians. And the entire international system of peace and security can stop such Russian atrocities. And that is why the main question today is how we will defend a human being in 21 century. Can we rely upon on the law or only weapons matter? The answer to this question defines our common future. And that is why this Russian war against Ukraine has a very vivid value dimension. This is not just the war between two states. This is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. And Russia tried to convince the whole world that democracy, rule of law and human rights are fake values. Because during the war, they couldn't protect anyone. Russia tried to demonstrate that country with a strong military potential and nuclear power can dictate their rules to the entire international community and even forcibly changed internationally recognized borders. We must to respond to this value dimension and demonstrate justice. This war turned people into the numbers because the scale of war crimes grow so large that it's become impossible to recognize all the stories. And that is why we have to provide chance for all victims, regardless who they are, their social position, the type of crime they endured, and whether or not media or international organizations are interested in their cases. We have to return people their names. People are not numbers. The life of each person matters. And that is why we have to establish a special tribunal and hold Putin, Lukashenko and other war criminals accountable. We must demonstrate that democracy is efficient the rule of law is important and justice is possible, even though delayed in time. Wonderful. That was partly an answer to your question. But Eka, could you take on uh, his question about uh, restorative justice versus retribution? 
Sure. I think part of um, what I began with resonates with this question. Um, at times, we really forget that it is not an internal conflict or civil war where retributive versus restorative justice has a different meaning into it, right? How the society heals and moves forward when the society itself was fractured when it comes to um, conflict, crisis that um, not only fragmented it, but then kept it pained, right? Um, uh, here we do have a situation of aggression occupation of some parts of Ukraine that have lasted as long as more than almost 20 years already uh, when it comes to Crimea and parts of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk as well. So when we speak about justice and accountability for the crimes that have been committed at a large scale to the degree that as a lawyer, I can claim already that it's we do have a genocidal intent quite present as well when it comes to atrocities that are committed against Ukraine. It's a matter of accountability that restores trust in justice per se that is lacking right now and that needs to be restored with concrete actions by ICC, local jurisdictions of some other countries that are pursuing uh, prosecution of crimes committed in Ukraine, and then the special tribunal for the crime of aggression that needs to be created as well. I have to say that the lack of justice led Russia to expand on its pathway of infringing upon the sovereignty, independence of its neighboring countries, and then infringing on the individual rights and, and, and then right to life of so many and dignity uh, in its uh, neighborhood and beyond, and not only in its neighborhood, but then in Syria and some other countries as we see now that Russians are very active, including in Africa. My own country has been occupied since 2008, partially, uh, we see uh, occupied territories in Transnistria, in de facto occupation as well in the country of Moldova. Uh, so lack of any accountability for the actions that Russia had in our own countries that preceded this large scale of aggression against Ukraine led Russia to believe that rules don't matter. And if you are powerful, big enough, and especially if you are nuclear power, you can do anything you can. And it's not only at the level of infringing the sovereignty of a country, but devaluing completely individual life and dignity, what Russia is doing at a massive scale now in Ukraine. This is not the theoretical question, what can work better in terms of restorative or retributive justice. We just need to regain trust that justice exists per se. And for that to happen, there needs to be accountability for what Russia did. And that's the only chance for Russia itself and Russian people to have a catharsis of their own for the future so that they can have a chance to overcome that legacy of atrocities and move forward as a country that could become once again part of civilized world. Something that we have seen in 20th century with Germany and German people that have owned what they have committed and went beyond it. And justice and accountability was a big component of that. Fantastic answer. Thank you, Eka. We have time for one more question. I'm going to take uh, this gentleman and then these guys. And thank you for giving us 15 more minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you to the speakers in Ukraine. Um, I just had a question. There was one speaker who said we need to win the war. And I, w one thing I, I thought of, and also with the um, response that we just received about, about uh, justice, is my understanding is there's over three, there are two coordinated operations um, that the Russians are undertaking. Um, I, I understand it's over 3 million uh, Ukrainian civilians who have been shifted into, into Russia. And as part of that, um, there's been a whole program of uh, forced adoption of Ukrainian children to into Russian families. <clears throat> I'm wondering with regards to winning the war and with regards to justice, how this over 3 million people, including many, I, I don't know how many thousands of children are involved, how they get to be, uh, their, their rights get to be addressed as well. Thank you. Super. Hold tight on that question. We're gonna take it with the last question. You guys can combine them. Thank you for an excellent panel. My name is Bob Berg. I'm former chairman of the uh, Alliance for Peacebuilding. In the American Revolutionary War a few hundred years ago, there were people who supported Britain 
and the reconciliation after that war between the groups that were for independence and the groups that were against was a big issue. And uh, uh, frankly, a very rocky issue for some years. I'm wondering whether you have thought of ways uh, where you have the internal divisions of part of your citizens now who are more attuned to Russia uh, being involved in the reconstruction in ways that could help bring those communities back together again. Felicity, you get that question. Okay, uh, Echo or Maria, who wants to take the children? Go ahead, Maria. Oh, uh, go ahead, Maria. Uh, okay, I, I, I will just say- And, and talk loudly, on. please. We, we, uh, we only have like three minutes. Okay, okay, uh, very quick. Uh, first of all, I would like to say as for children that uh, this process has started in 2015, at least in Crimea. So Russia started to illegally transfer Ukrainian children, Ukrainian citizens, I mean, to Russia and illegally adopt them to Russian families since 2015. And the Ukrainian state demanded to stop this process and to provide information on where those children are and et cetera, but we didn't get any information. And of course, we don't get this information now and international institutions unfortunately are help, helpless here. So they cannot establish where are those children even, and not to mention like how, how to bring them back now. But obviously it's one of the very important and crucial points in the process uh, that is going to take place um, in the, I mean, as a part of Ukrainian victory, obviously it, it is going to be one of the priorities to get the information about those children and bring them uh, back to, to Ukraine. Um, and as for the uh, issue of um, uh, a second question, uh, uh, um, I mean, I would say that the number of people who can be uh, defined as pro-Russian pro Ukrainians uh, dropped uh, very significantly since the beginning of the uh, large-scale invasion in particular. but. We understand that, of course, um, it's, uh, I mean, we think that it's, it would be an important uh, task for us uh, to provide this um, uh, environment uh, for, um, uh, to, to restore peace uh, in Ukrainian society. But I would like to emphasize again that we're not uh, talking about any reconciliation between uh, Ukrainians and those people who are engaged in the aggression. Uh, but we're talking about, first of all, uh, because we, I mean, war has brought lots of uh, drama in, in, into the country and lots of tragic events, but also we will have to deal with the, some internal recon reconciliation process again uh, between those people, for instance, who stayed in the occupation and those who had to flee. Uh, to, to uh, Ukrainian mainland or to not affect to, to the land which is not affected by the war or to the um, uh, countries abroad. Uh, so so I, but I don't think that there will be a problem with any like um, a good the issue of reconciliation with pro-Russian uh, Ukrainian citizens. I don't think that we have much of them, if any at all now. Super. E Eka, you get two sentences, and yeah. then Felicity gets two sentences. I think that that's, uh, I'll just end with where, where I began. It's the trust in social contract that is unprecedented right now between the citizens of Ukraine and then the political uh, framework of Ukraine as a government. And that trust in social contract and belonging will have to be rebuilt and then strengthened by those who will be in the deoccupied territories. And I think that there is a very clear realization of that in Ukraine, so that part of that rebuilding of Ukraine and reconstruction will be that pathway open for those who will want to be part of that. And then in that sense, there will be an open that to that. But it will be a complex process. It will be a process that needs to be built on that sense of belonging, common purpose, and then trust. And anchoring again of the development of the country within the EU and NATO is a, a great reinforcing element or pillars, so to say, of that process for the future. Thank you, Eka. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presence. Thank you. <laughs> So much for spending the evening with us. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for your patriotism. Thank you for your public service. Write these names down, follow these ladies, they're fantastic. And then uh, 
Mustafa, you can't hear us, but thank you for your presence. Hannah, thank you for your presence. And Felicity, thank you so much. Thank you to you all for putting up uh, with a very challenging AV system. Now you're rewarded with lunch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right.